Okay. Okay, the future of food. Thank you for being here, everyone. We are um, we're really looking forward to this with Bianca Tarrant. It's going to be amazing. Um, I'm just uh, going to send something through to Leanne. It was Roberta, someone Roberta. Um, you might want to check that so that she gets the correct Zoom link. Okay, good to have everyone here. Uh, we've got representation from all around the country today because this is such a hot topic and we're so lucky to have Bianca with us. Um, I'm Lynn Hawkins. I am the National Director and the Founder, actually, of Business Women Australia. Um, I love experimenting. I love doing stuff where we create things with all these members we've got all around Australia. So uh, before we start, just like to acknowledge this beautiful country in which we live um, and that we are meeting on sacred sovereign ground. I'm actually um, zooming in from Perth. It is uh, the wonderful country of uh, the Noongar Nation and the people um, uh, in the area where I am are the Wujuk people. And I'd like to pay my respects to all the elders past, present and emerging around this uh, wonderful country that uh, we're zooming in on and, and to really celebrate our Indigenous sisters in business. Um, many of our members have um, uh, got an Indigenous background, Indigenous heritage. It's really great to be able to do things with them um, and really acknowledge the great work that's going on with Aboriginal um, enterprise. So um, the BWA vision, for those of you who haven't heard this before, um, it's really a place where everyone's valued and we can contribute to the greater good. And we are really, really demonstrating a true collaborative uh, community. And obviously, obviously our focus is on women in business. Um, and that means, <clears throat> excuse me, pretty much anyone who's a working woman. Um, so executives and professionals, as well as entrepreneurs, um, and we help each other achieve our goals and dreams. So really understanding what our goals are is a part of what BWA is all about. We don't sit back at the beginning of the year and develop a program to roll out. We are evolving and developing our program with our mainly our premium, um, our premium members and our partners to deliver this phenomenal program. So uh, really raising that visibility of uh, female leadership and raising our voice as a community, showcasing what we what we can do. So as I said, you know, we've got, you know, C-suite women and women on boards, executives, entrepreneurs, founders, startups, uh, consultants, coaches, professionals, leaders, emerging leaders, and a few students in our community. And we really focus on these five areas of development, leadership being a massive priority, uh, business improvement and sharing you know, best practices around business and personal growth, influence and profile building, and of course, connecting. And I think um, most of our members would say that the thing they love most are the amazing friendships um, that we forge with female leaders all around the country. Really is, um, it's really special. Uh, these are our shared values. We have loads of values that we share, but these are the ones that we really focus on when we're looking at our program. Uh, we try and bring that element of honesty uh, and courage into our conversation. So they're really authentic, um, chats and deep meaningful chats no matter what our topics are we really love that um, open and conscious sharing um, and bringing a bit of a positive energy and a positive enthusiasm so our, our future focus is really on um, okay if we've got challenges how can we work together to overcome them if we've got ideas and opportunities how can we smash it out and have a crack at it together um, so loads of benefits, and I've got the wonderful Leanne Jeffrey on the line here. For anyone who's not a member and you want to get involved, and you're interested in what the difference is between um, the different memberships, have a chat to Leanne. For those of you who are on social and busy on social, which is most people these days, we have a LinkedIn group. Um, there's over 6,000 members, and that might be getting there seven, might even be more. That's a free group to join. You don't have to be a financial member of Business Women to join that group, but you do need to be a financial member if you want to post because we get uh, hundreds of requests to post, so we prioritise our members. Um, so that's a great place to promote your workshops, promote your women's events, promote you know your, your offers and share articles and blogs and whatever you want there. If you're a member, it's a great, it's a really great platform. Uh, we've got our website, of course, with our calendar. Our Facebook has got a public page and a private members group. 
Uh, we still haven't ditched e Elon Musk. We've got um, a Twitter handle. Um, and we've got Instagram, of course. Um, yeah, it's, that's an interesting interesting issue really around the, around the Twitter, but we're holding on to it for now. We might drop it. And we couldn't do what we do without these amazing people in the background that do all this stuff for us um, as a part of our collaboration and our partnership. Um, the CatCo team look after our website and do some of our socials. Um, uh, Intact Teams is um, founded by Jessica Schubert. She's the head of uh, leadership development. Anne-Marie Cross is our podcast queen. For those of you who are premiums and been interviewed by Anne-Marie, we love that and we push all that out through all our platforms. If you are a premium member and keen to get on that podcast, it's a great way of uh, raising your profile because we keep that recording of the podcast on our YouTube channel and it sits on our website as well. So, and then sits inside your directory listing on the BWA website. So um, we, we, like to, uh, we like our premium members to have maybe a couple of different topics over the years. So there's, um, you know, even if you've done one already, do, you know, think about what your next one's gonna be. What's the message you wanna get out there? Um, we do have a partnership with Jessica Schubert. Um, as I said, Intact Teams is one of our partners and they have the license for DISC Flow. For those of you who are aware of DISC, uh, that's a certification um, that is really great for teams understanding each other. And the DISC Flow actually incorporates the emotional intelligence aspect. It's sort of like the new version of DISC. And we have a special deal on our website. You can do it as a DIY or you can um, book into the next online, or I think there's some in-person disc flow stuff coming up in Melbourne. So um, jump onto that if that's something you're interested in. Another one of our partners, Fire Up Coaching, they're an RTO, registered training organisation. They're out of, Queen, out of Queensland or Sunshine Coast. Cathy McKenzie is, um, actually, we need to update her name there, LJ McKenzie. Cathy is, uh, she's a, She's an absolute um, dynamo. Any one of you who um, is looking for inspiration, have a chat to her, follow her, connect her on LinkedIn. Uh, we did, um, a, I did a cert for in coaching accreditation. I'm currently doing my diploma. It's a pathway through ICF, so it's, it's a great one to do. So we've partnered uh, with FireUp to offer that um, through our Business Women Australia community for anyone who wants to develop their coaching skills as a leader. And of course, some um, and many women are actually going in and creating coaching businesses. So uh, I did it from a leadership perspective. It's actually probably made me a better parent, to be honest, and maybe possibly a better wife. Um, Simon's not on the call, so I'll say, yes, it has made me a better wife. Definitely. Uh, so the yeah. Core Business Foundations, that was developed by Anne-Marie Cross. It's a really fantastic do-it-yourself course for those of you who are starting a business. Amory is an absolute brilliant marketer and she really helped you develop uh, through this a guided program um, to develop your signature system and how you create your different services, your good service, your better service and your top best service. It's a, it's a revolution in marketing thinking. Um, great to have new members. We love new members joining. It helps us fund all these heaps of things that we do. Uh, any money we make in BWA goes back into developing and doing more for the women in the community. Our shareholders don't take dividends. Um, and it's really a social enterprise. It's a cracker. So there's Leanne at businesswomenaustralia.com.au who's on the line. She's looking a little more blonde, maybe even a redhead now. And loads <laughs> coming up. So we've got in Perth heaps of stuff coming up because Perth is where I'm based. So it tends to be a bit more busy. We're looking for more people getting things busy in the other states because at one stage there, Queensland and Melbourne used to be more busy than Perth. So now that we've got COVID behind us, we can't use that as an excuse. Let's get back cracking and doing stuff. Queensland's got a community roundtable and connection on the 10th of March. Melbourne's got the 8th of March Leadership Insights with Catherine Leach, Q&A and networking after work. That would be definitely worth going to in the CBD. Um, on the 8th of March, Sydney Chats, Cheese and Wine is self-care a business superpower. Um, the wonderful Emma Gray is hosting that at the Fernery. So if you're um, in around the North Sydney Mosman area, that's going to be easy to get to. Um, if you're thinking about doing something for International Women's Day, jump on the 2nd of March online webinar. Care Australia and 
BWA do this every year. We look at um, ways that women can actually join forces to create the multiplier effect. Care Australia have developed some great tools uh, which will show you uh, showcase those and have a good conversation around the power of um, that multiplier effect in terms of when one woman um, is raised out of poverty or is, is steps up, um, she generally takes four others with her. So it's pretty, it's going to be a great one leading into International Women's Day. Rockingham's got a business women's lunch on 24th of February. LJ is actually um, hosting that one with the Rockingham ladies. And of course, we've got these uh, cheese and chats tomorrow night with Vita Carlino. And next week, um, our panel networking event, Empowered Women in Male Dominated Industries. Thanks to our partners, MK, MKT Tax Advisors and Mimi Go, who has worked tirelessly to organise that. It'll be at the Parmelia Hilton. So it's a lot on. And if we look in the BWA events calendar on the website and go through to March, there's even more coming up. So um, it's going to be a really exciting year. Last year we did 80 of 80 events. I reckon we're going to. I reckon we're going to get 100 events um, into the calendar this year without any trouble. So over to Bianca. I am so proud to have this amazing young entrepreneur. Um, she's co-founded um, Alcal with her husband uh, Dave, and um, she is a dynamo. You guys are going to have a real treat here. So I'm going to throw over to Bianca just to to um, Talk to us about how our cow has been so successful and a bit about her story to sort of get a feeling um, from her perspective how it's all come about. If you want to ask a question, pop it in the chat box and we will keep an eye on that. There will be, we've sort of carved out some time at the end for Q&A, but we'll see how we go with the chat. So over to you, Bianca. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Hello, everybody. Um, I guess I firstly just start off with explaining what our cow is to start with. So our cow, we're an online paddock to plate meat company. We home deliver grass fed organic and free range meat products and also wild caught seafood directly to our customers all across Australia. We work with about 150 farmers across Queensland and New South Wales at the moment. We work directly with those guys. Uh, we also have a processing facility based in Casino, which is in the Northern rivers of New South Wales. We, we employ about 45 staff, we butchers, meat packers, fulfillment, logistics, all that sort of stuff. So we dispatch our orders every day of the week. People order on our website. It's basically just like going to the butcher shop, but from the comfort of your own home. We have every different cut of meat that you can ever imagine. You can choose as much or as little as you like, and it all gets delivered to your door. So everything's cryovac, it's all packed in meal sized portions. It gets delivered in a little refrigerated box, like an insulated container and delivered to your door. So that's that's basically the um, what our cow is. And I guess how it started was 2019, well, actually go back a little bit further, 2017, Dave and I bought our first property. I was only pretty young. I was only 23. And it's really difficult for young people to get onto the land. Like it's, it's a ridiculous amount of deposit that you need to actually buy a farm to start with. So in excess of like 40 to 50% deposit before a banks will even look at you. So, you know, we had, we went out on a massive limb to purchase our farm and then we went into debt to, to, to stock it. So we had to buy livestock. We were on extremely high interest rates to buy the livestock. And then we came into a really bad drought throughout 2018, 2019 and 2020. So we, we, we bought livestock at top of the market before the drought hit. And then the drought came in and, you know, livestock prices plummeted and we were already in debt for them and we were selling them at a loss because we'd, we'd run out of feed, we'd run out of water um, and we needed to offload the stock because we couldn't afford to like feed them anymore. So, you know, we we're sort of in that position where we were selling our livestock at a loss. We we're kind of wondering like, what, what's the future going to be for our farm? We did that for three seasons where we sold our wieners off at a loss for no no profit and we decided, well, we needed to do something a little bit different because we couldn't afford to buy more more properties or more farmland to be able to maintain the stock that we had so we wanted to make the most out of the property our farm that we did have and try and guarantee ourselves a price for our livestock um, and that's sort of where the idea came about for selling meat because we knew that the price of meat doesn't fluctuate anywhere near as much as the sale yard prices do which is where most farmers sell their livestock like you just a, you just sell a commodity basically and you're always 
the price is so fluctuating and variable based on the weather, supply and demand, all sorts of things like that. So we wanted to take that variability out of our operation and bring some consistency to our farm. And we knew that there'd be lots of other farmers in the exact same boat as us where there, there's just so much inconsistency, so much variability. And we wanted to be able to, um, for ourselves, know the price we were going to get paid for our livestock because our input costs were always the same. So that's sort of where the idea came about. We um, we literally just started a Facebook page advertising some meat off our own farm for sale. We had no idea how we were going to cut it up, how we were going to process it, how we were going to deliver it. We didn't know anything. Like we're not butchers, we're not we're farmers. So it was like we just started this page and thought we'll see how it goes. And the 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 it was overwhelming, I guess, the uptake, the, you know, the interest that we had in the product. We had a vision of just, we had one little steer on our own place. We're like, yeah, we'll sell him and he'll be great. And it ended up that we sold almost six bodies on that first delivery. And we, um, we went to a butcher shop. We told him our crazy idea. He was like, yeah, that's fine. He also lent us a cold room trailer. So we hooked it up to the back of the Toyota. We drove all around Brisbane and around these one way streets with a big land cruiser and a refrigerator trailer getting lost around Brisbane, delivering meat everywhere. And that's sort of how it started was it's just rolled on from there. The, you know, the demand has just increased, the, um, the interest has increased and we were really quickly able to connect with other farmers as well. And, you know, sort of tell them our crazy idea and they thought, well, it's not, not bad. So how did, how did they get on board? So yeah, that's sort of um, how the business has started and where we're at today, I guess. That's so phenomenal. My God, you know, I mean, it's you and Dave must have a real appetite for one risk taking, you know, so from the beginning and then being able to think outside the box to problem solve all those sorts of things. I know that we we described you as opportunistic and you really are. Yeah, it, when you put in a position like what we were in, I guess, with the drought and then we like when the drought came through, we had the bushfires as well. So you just put in a position where you really have to think outside of the box. Like you don't want to be ever in that same position again. And I guess before that, we were we both had jobs beforehand that we really didn't enjoy. So we wanted to do something different. We wanted to make it succeed. So we didn't have to, um, I guess, go back to that. And you didn't have a background in farming, did you? Did Dave? So Dave grew up on a beef and banana farm when he was young. Um, the family sort of lost the farm over the years to droughts and everything else. And he, he's been, you know, he grew up on a farm. Farming's in his blood and he always wanted to move back to the farm, but not for me. I grew up in Port Macquarie on the beach. So um, it was a very big reality shock for me to move to the farm. Like, so like I said, big deposit, 40% deposit to get onto the farm. I was thinking this is going to be amazing, like living on a farm. It's going to be like so romantic and horses and sunsets and all that jazz. No, we moved into a shed. We had no power, no running water. It was literally a tin shed with a mattress on the ground. I was like, what have I done? But anyway, um, it was like we were flat broke. So we lived off literally mandarins. We had a mandarin tree. So we had mandarins and sayo biscuits. And that was us for like three months. And Dave used to hold a garden hose for me so I could wash my hair. It was like, you know, that was us for months and months on the farm. And we didn't have power or anything like that. So, you know, safely say I had power and I have a shower now on the farm. But, you know, the first few months were pretty tough. I'm really interested in hearing about how you navigated that in terms of the stresses on your relationship. But before we go into that, tell us about how you've, you know, what, what was it that triggered your interest in then crowd equity funding? And tell us about that in terms of how and why you use that approach to scale. Yeah, so we only did our first capital raise last year, it was May last year. Prior to that, the business has just 100% been bootstrapped by Dave and me. Like we have never had investment. You know, we didn't have a big bank account. Like I said, we were struggling to buy groceries at one point. So it's just been bootstrapped the whole way along. Like we've never had massive amounts of money in the bank. We've always just gone off, um, you know, the sales that we we're able to bring into the business, keep reinvesting it and keep step, like um, growing, I guess. Like there's been numerous sleepless nights of how we're going to pay our bills how we're going to pay our wages like it's not been there's never just been a big abundance of money um, and we kind of got to a certain point where we'd taken 
we were leasing a butcher shop, which was fine. Like we were leasing the butcher shop and we were processing in there. And it got to the point where we were way too big. I kind of picture like, you know, in Alice in Wonderland, how she's inside that giant, she turns giant and she's inside this little house. That's what we were like in this butcher shop. So we, we moved to a much bigger processing facility and it was probably two or three steps too big. And we got in here, you know, there was four, we had four staff at that point and we we're like god damn how are we going to pay our bills it just was out of control and you know we we managed to fumble through and we got to a certain point where we we're like we really need to bring some investment into the business so we can keep growing like we had so much interest and all that sort of stuff so um yeah we start, we decided to go down the path of crowdfunding because we already had such an amazing community like we had so many customers that supported us we had this amazing network of farmers we had lots of followers on social media and the idea of crowdfunding really um what it really built more of a sense of community for us and our customers it gave out the opportunity for our farmers to actually be involved in the company and they wanted to see a future for as well because it's obviously assisting their farm and their farming operations so yeah it just really built a strong sense of community for us and it also allowed Dave and I to retain a lot of control in the business like because we're quite young and we were still in startup and growth phase we didn't want to relinquish a lot of control we wanted to still be able to remain nimble and do what we needed to do to continue to grow the business without giving up a lot of I guess equity and control. So how much equity did you give up through that first round of funding? I think it was about um four percent or six percent I can't remember exactly off the top of my head but we raised we raised 2.5 million at a 30 million dollar valuation and that was within so the business valuation was 30 million after three years yeah and that's phenomenal and and kudos to you too because that um that having a 30 million val meant that you could then give such a small percentage to equity funding and raise, you know, that 2.5 mil. So where did you spend that 2.5 mil to start off with? Where was your key focus? Um, a lot of it was around marketing. So we invested heavily in like a lot of above the line brand marketing, staff, equipment. Um, we also invested in a, a new website as well, which we're reinvesting in again. So a lot of it was around like marketing tech, our team, and just continuing to grow. Yeah, and out of that, you know, when you look back, what would be the lessons learned, do you think? What were the the gotchas that you didn't realise knowing now you might have done a bit differently? Um, probably just understanding the platform a little bit better. Like we, we um, and understanding the customer journey from the platform, we decided this time, we're obviously doing another crowdfund at the moment. We've changed platforms to a different provider because we wanted to make sure that the customer experience was as seamless as possible. So that was probably one thing that we learned was just um, changing that. And we spent a lot of time with lawyers and solicitors and going over the offer documents and the CSF. Like we have a really good understanding of crowdsource funding now and what what's involved in that. Yeah, and um, do you, are you st- you're still happy that that's the way you went? I mean, you're doing yeah, it again, yeah. right? Yeah, 100%. Like it, it was the best decision for our business. That was the best form of capital that we took on. And we're, we're obviously doing it again because we really like the crowdsource funding. And it's a really, it's about a sense of community as well. Like, you know, the people that are investors of ours, they're never going to shop for meat anywhere else. And they're going to tell all of their friends and all of their family members that they're an owner. You know, they own a part of our cow. It's just like having walking billboards everywhere. That's amazing. So what, what are you after in this round of capital raise? Uh, it's a 2.5 again. So uh, as a crowdfunding, you can only raise 5 mil in a 12-month period. So we're just topping up the rest of the, the raise. Interesting. That's uh, It's such a novel and um, clever approach. I, I love it. And, I, you know, obviously being community, community builders here, we just think that just makes total sense. So, yeah. okay, um, that's really good. And thank you for so honestly sharing that because it really does make a difference. You know, so when you said you were happy to talk about all that, it just really does make a difference for us to think about our own businesses and how we're scaling things. Um, so in terms of your your thoughts around the future of food and sustainability um, of rural and regional Australia, what are, what are your, you know, what would you, I know you're very passionate about this. Yeah, I guess 
our sort of I mean we're farmers so we see it from a farming perspective and now that we're also dealing with consumers we're starting to see a lot more from our customers eyes as well like it's really taken Dave and I a good probably three years to really see the business in our customers eyes because I guess we we're so we're so rural you know we we see the farm every day we probably take a little bit for granted what we do and the the lifestyle that we have access to so we've really seen that agriculture is going to be driven by people in the city and it's going to be driven by people who purchase our food so we want to have an influence on our consumers and on the wider domestic Australian food market because Things like sustainability, you know, climate change, environmental practices is all going to be driven by the way that people choose to eat. So we think that the more the more people that choose to eat produce that's been ethically farmed, sustainably produced, um, it's come from free range organic farms, that sort of stuff, it's going to have a profound impact on the climate and sustainability going into the future. So we want to provide people an avenue to purchase food like that but and not be you know exorbitant prices or unattainable to to get to you know I think about farmers markets which I love going to but it's not a possibility for everybody in the world to get to a farmers market on a Saturday so you know we want to provide people that kind of produce through an online avenue so that they know that they're buying directly from farmers the produce is good quality they're looking after the environment and they're also looking after the farmer as well. Did you have some of the local farmers in the district sort of saying, this is, this is, you know, this, you know, this is going to be really hard for you guys. You know, what are you doing? Everybody. Like they I don't want to use so... the word crazy because I've already been <laughs> everyone in the on this call saying this is not crazy. This is just different. This is awesome. Yeah. It, there was a lot of um, I guess doubt and skepticism about the business model because, you know, Food in Australia and selling livestock has been the same for the last 200 years. You know, it's never it's never been challenged. And everybody that we spoke to said your overheads are going to be too high. You're not going to be able to do it. Cold chain logistics, packaging, meat processing. You know, you, you t- you're trying to control the entire supply chain. No one's ever done that before. So it was, you know, there was a lot of negativity around it. But we're, we're, we haven't just clicked our fingers and it all happened overnight. Like we've grown into what we are now, step by step. You know, we we bit off a little bit and then continued to grow. So there has been a lot of um, a lot of skepticism about it. And to be honest, like every farmer has always thought about selling their own produce. Like it's it's always crossed every farmer's mind. Oh, I wanted to do a box meat, or I wanted to go to the farmer's market, or I wanted to know my customers. So every farmer's thought about it. But a lot of farmers aren't very good at all of that other stuff. You know, they're good at farming. They're great at growing beef or they're great at growing crops. So we've enabled our farmers just to continue to do that and do it well. And we handle everything else. So, you know, they're they're growing the best quality beef that you can possibly ever imagine. And we handle the logistics. We handle the processing. We handle the marketing. And we're giving those guys a voice and a connection to their consumers. It's incredible. It really is. I mean, you for you, it probably feels like it's been a long time and step by step process. Um, for for an old chick like me, I'm going twenty twenty seventeen. You bought the farm, and it's it's only twenty twenty two now. What you've achieved in such a short time is like, whoa. Okay, so I'm interested that you mentioned wild caught fish. So what what got you thinking about adding fish to the to the service? Well, seafood is the number one thing that our customers have asked for. So it was we we put a survey out. We wanted to see what people wanted to purchase and what they what else what else would they buy from us if we had other products. And seafood was the number one thing that everyone said, and it just made sense to tack that onto our offering. So it's only just we haven't hard launched it yet. It's only been soft launch, and we've only had it for about two weeks. But we've connected with some really good fishermen, and they're in the exact same boat as us. Like us as farmers, you know, they're dealing with price fluctuations, illegal fishing, imported products, um, you know, being screwed over by the big guys. So they're they're dealing with the same thing as a beef or lamb farm is dealing with. So and they want to have an avenue to go direct to consumer as well. So we've introduced wild caught seafood. Um, it is super variable, much like farming. Like you know, we can't have wild caught barramundi all the time because the fishing season isn't 12 months of the year so we're sort of dealing with that and educating our customers that if you want to have the, you know that kind of level of produce where it's wild caught sustainably fished and farmed it's not available all the time 
So I think the supermarkets have done a really good job of telling us that we can have food all the time when it's actually not produced every all the time, you know, like we, we can, we're able to go and pick an avocado out of the supermarket shelf when avocados aren't in season. So it's just about educating our customers that not everything is in season all the time. Um, and uh, Josie's uh, just asked um, in the chat box there, do your farmers follow regen ag principles? Yeah, so it's an interesting question. We get asked that all the time. Like we're not really big on labeling what our farmers do because majority of our farmers are like older. And if you said to them, oh, do you farm regeneratively? They'd say, what the bloody hell is that? And if you explain to them, you know, do you rotate your paddocks? Do you spray microbes? Do you, you know, rotationally graze? That sort of stuff. They say, oh yeah, I've done that forever. You know, I, mm. I do that. I, my, that's what my dad did or that's what my grandparents did. And we had a farmer here last night and he said he had a soil test done on his place and he's never heard of the word regenerative agriculture. So I don't know what that is. And they had a soil test done on their farm and the agronomist said, what are you doing here? Because I've never seen soil this healthy before. And he said, mm. well, I just do what we've always done. You know, we wrote out our paddocks. We we fertilize, we also run chickens, we we do all this, of, the, of this stuff. So they're actually doing yeah. it, but they don't know that they're doing it, which is, I think it's even more humbling as well. Like we've put all these labels on what's agriculture and what kind of way do you farm when they're just doing it because they know that's the best thing for their land and they know it's the best thing for the future generations to come on. They know if they don't look after what they're doing, they're going to produce poor quality produce. Like the, the, the animals aren't going to put the weight on. They're not going to do as well. So it's literally in their best interest to, to look after their land as best they can. So one, they can produce good quality animals. Two, they get paid for the better quality it is. And three, so they can have the next gen coming onto the land as well. Yeah, yeah cool. so you you mentioned um organic um are they certified organic or is it some, um... some of our farmers are so we have a we have an organic certified chicken farmer but we don't stipulate that all of our produce needs to be organic because not every farmer can obtain an organic certification for me on my farm where i'm located i can't get an organic certification because we have parasites we have ticks we have flies all of those things that need to be treated with some sort of chemical for the animal welfare, for the welfare of the animal. And you know, we would much rather that the animal has been looked after and is not you know, being mistreated or being susceptible to diseases or parasites or whatever, just because of an organic certification. So if our farmers can obtain it, perfect, that's great. If not, and they're still ticking all of our other boxes, like they're grass fed, they're sustainable, their animal welfare is really high, um, you know, all of those other boxes that they need to tick, then we will still go with them, even if they're not sort of certified organic. Yeah, it makes a business, sorry, sorry, Lynn, it makes a big difference if they're not um, grain fed lots, you know, really big farms on massive scale. I think if they're grass fed and it's it's more forgiving, it's kind of more achievable to be a region ag farmer than it is to be an organics farmer. Yeah. Mm. Sorry, Lynn. No worries, Josie. Is is that you happy? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I might reach out to Bianca about what we do later. I won't hog the her mic time. Okay, thanks for that. Okay, so challenges that and opportunities for women, Bianca. I mean, this is uh, obviously business women Australia. So very interested in your thoughts around, um, you know, in rural and regional Australia. What what do you see the opportunities for women being, or is it just is that an, an a moot point? No, I think the way that agriculture is going now is definitely going more down a female path, which is really good to see because like I've spent my my entire life, I've been in very male dominated industries. So before I was farming, I was mining. So I've been in um, involved in male industries forever and I still see it now, you know, like we'll go somewhere and everyone goes to shake Dave's hand first and they talk to Dave about the business and all that sort of stuff. And Dave's really good, you know, he's like, oh, it's, Bianca's the brains behind the whole operation and he sort of throws the ball to me but I do see a lot more females coming through the industry now which is really good like I'll go down to the sale yards where we, you know all the livestock is sold and sure majority of the guy it's men but in the back where all the hard work happens it's all girls like the girls are out there making turning the wheels and keeping the ball rolling out there so I just think like power to the girls like there's so many opportunities in agriculture at the moment and I'm seeing so many opportunities come up especially in things like 
um, you know, mustering and Jillaroo jobs and out on station, station hands, like they're actually starting to prefer females out there now. And I did see that in the mining industry as well. Like they're actually preferring females out there because they just have a different perspective on things than, than the bloke. So yeah, I'm definitely seeing a shift, which is really good to see. Yeah, that's, it is, it's quite phenomenal, isn't it? <clears throat> so, um, so what are the other tips that you would give? Um, obviously, what you've learned as an e really an e-commerce and logistics company, when you think about it, what are the tips that you would give, you know, other budding entrepreneurs and those in business management roles, um, you know, in terms of what you've learned and what, what you would advise? Yeah, I guess... Um... Well, I've, I've touched on it before, but like building a community has probably been the number one thing for us and just being really authentic. Like we've we've had a, a strong reason why from the start with why we started the business, what we wanted to achieve, why we were doing it. And we've maintained that throughout the whole, the whole period, I guess, that we've been in business. And um, from a marketing perspective, I guess, being really authentic in what we do, like we've never fluffed anything up or tried to fool people with anything. You know, we've just told our story educated customers I guess on what we do and explain why we do it as well like and just being ourselves and and as a couple you know navigating all those challenges and that and all the complexities that goes go with scaling so quickly really you know as a, how have you maintained your you know your love for each other and your 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 partnership with great difficulty yeah <laughs> <laughs> <The honesty. laughs> <laughs> it's it's not easy like let me tell you there's so many there's been so many sleepless nights and I guess with the amount of pressure like we're the only one we do it to ourselves like we put ourselves under the amount of pressure that we do no one else is it's you know we're 100% doing it to ourselves but it hasn't been easy to maintain that and I think um like one thing that we've identified a lot which helped us out is that we actually read a book and listened to the podcast by Alison Armstrong called Understanding Women. And it was really good for Dave and I to both understand how a woman performs in, an, in a role such as being a leader or being a boss or a manager or an entrepreneur. Like you actually become quite masculine. So it's been good for, for us to identify, like, especially for myself, like when I'm in my masculine compared to when I'm in my feminine, like when I'm at work, I'm like, don't talk to me, Dave, don't touch me, don't hug me, don't kiss me. I'm a boss today. Like I, I can't be your partner right now. We'll do that after five o'clock. So, you know, it, and it, there's really a process to sort of change from going from being in my masculine to being in my feminine. Like I, you know, I have to go home, get changed, get out of my uniform and that sort of stuff. And then I kind of transition, but it has, it's been good to kind of identify what happens to a woman when they, when we are in roles like that, because we're not, you know, women are kind of more they're feminine, you know, like if, and you get looked at differently as well. Like if, if I was the, the wife of Dave and I come to work with my tray of biscuits and made everyone coffee, like, you know, I'd be viewed differently, but because I'm viewed in, um, a boss position I have to I feel like I have a more of a responsibility to uphold that so I'm not super feminine um, but yeah it has been challenging and we have to do things to I guess maintain that level of relationship as well like you we started doing dance lessons and that's like out of control so we could just go and be a couple together one night a week because otherwise we'd we'd finish work we'd sit at the table we'd talk about work we'd go to bed we'd talk about work we'd get up in the morning and talk about work like everything was just work based so we actually had to physically and consciously do something to get us out of that and it, it has been difficult like there's a lot of heated conversations that go on a lot mm -hmm. yeah that's it there's an interesting comment you know I think Amy's saying it's it's tough that we have to quite often hide that feminine side and that's your journey really at the end of the day uh, I know that as I've um, got through in terms of later in my career, I've actually been able to become and embrace more of my feminine without giving giving up on my strength as a leader and as a, yep. a determined and bossy bitch really at the end of the day. Um, but, you know, this, this is your journey and your story. And I really, um, I really admire, you know, your own, you know, the sense of awareness that you have and the fact that you and Dave have actually put in place some things to really nurture and build your relationship and recognizing this really quite early in your journey it's really um 
is really it's really impressive and inspiring. Um, so another one here is you know in terms of um, you, how would you describe yourself? Have you always been a bit of an opportunist, a bit of a go getter through your life? Yeah, I think so. Like I've, um, um, yeah, I think I think I would say that. Yeah, I guess you don't really reflect on yourself too much when you're moving at such a fast pace. But yeah, I've like always worked a lot, um, wanted a lot, wanted more than what I always had. You know, like I've I bought my first house when I was twenty. I um, traveled a lot, worked ridiculous hours. So, you know, I, I have always sort of overachieved, but um, yeah, it's just what drives me, I guess. Can you describe your curse. family? What, like, what kind of life was your family life? Did it come from the way your parents? Were? No, I don't think so. Like my parents were just blue collar workers. Like my dad was a tradesman. My mum was a nurse. I went to a normal Catholic school. I didn't go to university. I, I actually hated school with a passion. So I didn't haven't done any kind of degrees or anything like that. I've just um, left school. I was a youth worker for quite a few years. So I worked with disengaged young girls in the community. And then I went on to mining and then met Dave and we bought, we bought the farm. So I haven't, haven't like, you know, done any sort of crazy things or anything like that. Well, it's just, um, I, I can see that pragmatism and the wanting to do things differently coming through even that story. Uh, so being being pragmatic and problem solving. So you mentioned um, the book there, Understanding Women. Have there been any other kind of resources that you found to be really useful? Yeah, I, there's just been a couple of things, I guess. That one probably has been one of the key ones and just connecting with other women as well, like exactly like what we're doing here. You know, you listen to other women's journeys and what they do and how they deal with things and just to understand that what you're going through, you're not the only person that's been through it. There's plenty of other women that have walked in your shoes and been on the journey that you're on as well. So that's been one thing for me is like just remembering, you know, I'm not the only one that's done this. There's other women that have been exactly where I am right now and lean on other people for advice. Yeah, and what about um, in terms of government funding and any access to sort of government resources or helping you with business plans, that sort of thing? Did you tap into any of those kind of sort of stru structures or group support? Yeah, so we did a we did a course back in the early days when we first started farming called the Profitable Farmer, which was by Farm Owners Academy, and that really helped us um, learn to run our farm not so much like a farm and more like a business like it taught us how to be profitable and how to track budgets and a lot about our mindset and that sort of stuff and we ended up connecting with one of the coaches off there and we um, have always had a business coach pretty much since we started we had a coach that would just you know challenge us and really hold us accountable to different things and then we um yeah, we worked with him, but government funding, not really. I did apply for the Boosting Female Founders Grant last year. So I was a successful applicant of that, which was really amazing. But, it, you know, again, a lot of lot of work goes into that. Not I can't stand reading or doing grants. So I had to work with a grant writer that helped me get all of that stuff organised because, you know, putting stuff on paper is not really my forte. But they helped me out with all that sort of stuff. And we got we got the grant over the line, but there are there is a lot of support out there, especially for females in business. So, you know, I'd encourage everybody to have a look at that sort of stuff wherever you can. Yeah, that's awesome. And did you look outside Australia in terms of international different kind of business models to inspire you to structure our cow? Yeah, well, we were sitting in a conference one day and we had the MLA, so Meat and Livestock Australia. They sort of were speaking about the food, the in, you know, the future of food and what's happening over overseas and in the states and that sort of stuff. And we, there are a few other businesses like ours in the states that do exactly what we do at a massive scale. So we kind of looked to those guys for advice and for modelling and what works for them and what we can do here in Australia. So yeah, we're always looking at. Um, I guess we stand on the shoulders of giants. You know, we, we, we looked at other companies and what they were doing and what we could learn for them and what we could implement here. Yeah, that's fantastic. So I'm just going to pull up the chat. Anyone, um, anyone who wants to um, ask Bianca any questions, pop your hand up if you want in the, or, um, so we can find you and Leanne will give me a hoy about who there is out there while I'm going through. Um, so the can other I thing ask a quick question? Yeah, please do. Um, I think you know one thing I actually really want to know is you know, you have made 
like massive steps that I think, you know, obviously you've had a lot of backlash with people doubting you and things like that, but what would be the the big mistake that you learned from? Because usually, so, you know, there's some somewhere where we stumble, but where, you, you know, and sometimes you stumble to the point where you go, you know what, this is too hard, I'm, I'm out, or you learn. What yeah. would you say you, you learned from with that? Um, oh, God, that's a hard question. Probably, like, always looking, you know, we thought we were on the right track with our business forever since the start, you know, like we sold meat, this is what we did, blah, blah, blah. But it got it got to the point where we were hitting a ceiling, you know, like we, we couldn't get our revenue any higher. We couldn't grow anymore. We were just consistently hitting this ceiling month on month. And one of our coaches said to us, like, you, you may be on the right path, but you need to just look one or two degrees in the other direction and you'll be, you, you'll find the right path that you need to go down. And that's what we did. Like we kind of pivoted our business a little bit to move more towards a subscription model rather than just chasing a once off order. So we were chasing, you know, we'd, we'd have a really cracking month and then we'd get to the next month and go, shit, we need to find more orders again. Like we were just doing that every month that we'd go and chase more orders, chase more orders. And we decided to move the business to more of a subscription model where you know, people subscribe, they go to box and meat delivered every month. And that was probably a really big pivot for us in our business. And it completely changed the direction of the business to where it is now. And I don't know if we hadn't have looked in a different direction where we would be right now, because that was the point where we're like, is there a future for us here anymore? What are we going to do? We can't pay our staff. It's just not, not getting any bigger. So just always looking one or two degrees in a different direction. You, you may be so close to where you need to be, but it only you only need to pivot a little bit to find find that sweet spot. And uh, I'll throw over to Becky. She's got a question as well. Put yourself off mute, Becky. <laughs> Sorry, kids and dogs running around in the background. I don't want you guys to have to totally fine. Hear that old one. <laughs> um, I guess my question. Oh, look, I've I've just just to, to put it out there, I've been weirdly following you for ages <laughs> and really loving what you guys have done. Um, I'm, I would love to do something similar to you or be involved somehow, but I'm just so um, just right down with the cows still. Like every day yeah. I'm just thinking about genetics and I'm thinking about um, you know, what is going to create that successfully grass finished coastal steer, you know, like I can't, I haven't got that scope for, for, for business, but that's, I know that that's what keeps me going. I know that that's my key driver is, is, is getting out there and spending time, you know, <laughs> in looking at pasture, looking at soil, looking at cattle, cuddling them, smelling them. Um, what is, that's what's gonna take me away from performing in a business sense, if you know what I mean. What keeps you connected to what you're producing? What keeps you excited about what you do? And what keeps pushing you to the next step, I guess, um, as far as, you know, just wanting to, some days it can be so, especially the last three years, it's just been, you know, a bastard trying to keep going every day. <laughs> um, what keeps you going every day? What's your little nugget of gold that you retreat back to when it's hard, you know, when people are telling you that it's dumb and yeah. you're not going to get it done? Whereabouts are you based, Becky? Oh, we're just down near Bellingen, down oh, um, yeah. Bellingen, between Bellow and Barraville. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So I guess like I can talk to a couple of points, you know, the, the cattle side of things, we've got farmers that are the same, you know, like they want to know how they can produce the best quality grass fed coastal beef. And a lot of them have like nailed it. So if you ever want some tips with genetics and that sort of stuff, like we've got farmers near your place that aren't, that are like, doing an unbelievable job so I know what you mean there um and it yeah. is hard when you're in the when you're working so deeply in the business like you're 
feeding and planting and cropping and all that sort of stuff, it's difficult to pull yourself out and think, okay, what, what can I do to grow? But sometimes you need to slow down to speed up. So, you know, yeah. we, if things are getting out of control, you can just slow down a little bit and think, okay, well, is, is there a way that I can put someone on to help me so I can step out a little bit and start thinking a bit more on the business rather than in the business. And I guess yeah. having, having a reason why like farming is so bloody hard that it's never ever completed like there's always a fence to fix there's always a paddock to plow there's always cattle to feed so it's never like you're just going to wake up one day and oh, I've arrived and that's one thing that we battle with a lot is like you don't just arrive at where you want to be like it's this is a marathon you don't it's not just gonna <laughs> nothing is ever going to be perfect and that's probably what we say to ourselves a lot is done is better than perfect you know we're not striving for perfection we just want the work done and we just want the job done so we can keep moving and keep growing yeah okay. so and just ha having a strong why like you know what you want to do and it's difficult for farmers to maintain one sense of direction like as a farmer you're always chasing that shiny object you know like oh, we're going to breed Wagyu and we're going to breed this and we're going to breed that because it's where the money is right now. But I think if it's kind of like if you hold a magnifying glass on something for long enough, it'll catch fire. And that's one thing that farmers are probably not the best at is they're always chasing the shiny object. Like, you know, they're chasing the new best thing. But if you do something and you do it really well, then you will succeed. Yeah. What's your Thanks. why? Our why was to have a market for our livestock. You know, we, yep. we wanted to have a sta stable yeah. and consistent market. Yeah. So we didn't want to be price takers anymore. We didn't want to produce wieners and go to the sale and go, God, I hope someone's there to go and buy my cattle today or yeah, I hope the prices are yeah. up. Like it's, it's yeah. so stressful not being able to know. And you know what? There's no other industry that you don't know what you're no. going to get for your, your stock that you're selling. Like you own a dress shop. Yeah. You, ha you know what your retail price is. You own any other off. kind of shop. But as a farmer, you just hope. Thanks, Becky. Yeah. Over to Biliana. Biliana's had her hand up for a tick. Hi, Bianca. Thank you very much for um, sharing this absolutely impressive story. Um, my question is, and it probably blows on from what you just said, um, have you had any business plan or um you know so you came with this absolutely amazing idea you thought well okay we can do this you know we have the power to do this uh, but did you then have to put all these numbers through and you know think of are we actually going to be valued at 20 mil um down the track in two years time or uh, did you more go with your gut feel and knowing that you know you're doing what you like um you're going with a full heart in it or was it more of a you know logic had to be part of it as well um at the start like in the early days when we first started it was there was no logic it was all just like what what we thought was right but as the business has progressed we've spent a lot of time putting things down on paper and a lot of numbers and you know now that we have shareholders and investors we have to spend a lot more time doing that but at the start we, you know we were just running off a whim really we when we did the Farm Owners Academy course I mentioned before, we learned how to do a vision traction organizer. So it was basically like we put our vision down, we put out what measurables would get us to that goal. So, you know, we had a goal of, to start with, we wanted to take three orders a day on our website. So that was the goal that we had. And then we put the steps in place of, okay, how are we going to take three orders a day? What does that look like? How are we going to get there? And we just like, we, we always work backwards from the goal and we still run today off our vision traction organizer. So we have our goal of a million members in our meat subscription club. What does that look like? Where's the business base? How many staff do we need? What kind of products are we offering? What's the product range? All of the, you know, they're the questions that we're asking ourselves. We always start with the end in mind. Like what does that goal look like? And then how are we going to get there? And over to Tracy Cooper, who's also uh, had her hand up for a while. Thanks, Lynn. Bianca, I just want to say, well done. It's um, it's an impressive story. I actually have a farming background myself. I grew up in farming in Tenerfield in northern New South Wales. And, yeah, just um, up the road. Yeah, and I'm still a part owner of that, but I'm not. I'm in Brisbane now doing other things. We've changed. So it's impressive to see and hear young people take such a plunge in the industry because it's a, it can be a very traditional industry, um, growing meat. And um, I just was thinking about 
it, and it comes back to three P's, I suppose. There's the product, the beef, there's the people that you have to handle in the process. And I yeah. guess it's a bit of a double bunger question, but where would you say your greatest challenge is in the business, sort of in those areas? And where's your greatest success? You know, people, product, process. It's because as Lynn said, it's a logistics processing really but as farmers you just said it before we tend to focus on the product a lot yeah but it's the product is not always going to cut it as far as creating success so your challenge and your success I suppose in that sort of areas yeah yeah well I guess like we're, we're never going to be able to compete on price with the supermarkets right. or scale so our our difference was always on the the quality of the product and our brand, like our community, the people that we are and the people that we work with. So that's probably two things that we focus on is the product and the people. The product. Um, yeah, like we, we knew that we were producing a really good quality grass-fed product and we knew that our farmers were as well. So we, we could always win on quality of product. And also the people, like it's just, I think people resonate with people. Like from the very start, it's just been Dave and I telling our story you know, we're farmers, we're relatable, we're going through the same shit that everybody else is in their life and we've just been relatable to people. So we haven't tried to put up a, you know, a really facade of we've got it all organised and everything's great. Like we've just been really authentic and um, I guess gen gen general to people, I guess, like open, expressive, all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, we've just tried to be ourselves, build a community and tell that story. Yeah, and I'd say that the, the community and the relationships, it's about growing meat and it's about getting it into people's homes, but I'd say it's the relationships that you've grown and nurtured yeah. is backed, backed by the lovely meat that you would obviously have, but it's the people, I would think, that's the... Yeah, more yeah. than anything, you know, it's the farmers that we've connected with and our customers and, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well done. Well and done, Josie, Josie and others um, have asked about the different... Um, crowdfunding equity platforms that you've used because you used you used a different one to start off with than what you're using now right yeah so this time we're going through virtual and we've been really happy with virtual um, they've done a great job their process is really clear they're, they're obviously a, a quite a well-known crowdsource funding platform and they've done a fantastic job so far so we're really really looking forward to the raise opening on the 21st of February we currently have like the largest amount of people that have expressed interest we have their largest ever webinar tonight that they've ever hosted and yeah it looks like it's going to sell out within the first 48 hours so super pumped about that have you got any plans to go international at the moment we're just focusing on domestic like we think there's still a really big opportunity here domestically we may open up internationally and do some export stuff in the next 12 to 18 months who knows but at the moment the main focus is just domestic Interesting. And, um, and of course, in terms of you and your own private wealth, you know, separate to the business, how are you and Dave setting yourselves up um, financially for the future, you know, uh, so that all this hard work is also generating some sort of pathway for future wealth growth? Yeah, it's such a funny thing. And we were talking about this the other day, like there's this real misconception you know, between a lot amongst a lot of people that because you own a business and, you know, we're forecasting all this revenue and the business is valued at this, like me and Dave must be just rolling around in hundred dollar bills. And that's not the case. <laughs> like it's, <laughs> it's, um, you know, we're, we're, we're earning a wage for the first time in three years. And it really shot ourselves in the foot actually, because we didn't pay ourselves for two and a half years and we just reinvested everything into the business. Like, you know, we, yeah, it was really struggle town for like two and a half years for us. And we didn't pay ourselves and it kind of shot ourselves in the foot because um, we, on that, according to the ATO, we earned no money. So it didn't, I don't recommend doing that. If you're going to start a business, pay yourselves. And then look at like, now we're starting to set ourselves up a little bit more, putting a bit of money away. But I guess our payday is not going to be until the business becomes liquid. Like still, yeah, the business, like we're going at this raise with a 60 mil valve, we're still not rolling around a hundred dollar bills, but we're trying to set ourselves up because we know our payday is going to be when we sell out or when we, you know, become acquired or the business becomes liquid or whatever. So that sort of we've got the end in mind and we're prepared to 
put in the hard yards and, you know, we don't need a lot, I guess, at the moment to survive. Like we've got a roof over our head. We've got fuel in our car. We've got food in our bellies. We're not, we don't have a super lavish lifestyle where we're happy with where we're at and we can see the future and the end in mind. Yeah, well, this is the trap, you know, that a lot of entrepreneurs get caught in and, and one where when they look back at the big lessons learned is not actually setting up those payments and having, you know, a financial wealth um, protection plan and growing your wealth and putting diversifying your investing outside your business um, and I think you know that um, when we look at that that we often see that all that hard work is kind of often waiting for the then the end sale date of of the business entity that that an entrepreneur grows but really a lot of opportunities in in the pathways and the journey especially when you're so young so it's great to hear you're actually starting to think about that and that it was only two years, really. You know, I've had I've had entrepreneurs, you know, talking to me about not taking a wage for a lot longer than two years. So it's good you've woken up to that early. Yeah, you sort of shoot yourself yeah. in the foot a little bit by not taking. And you live in a false sense of reality as well. Like if, you know, the business was, if the business didn't have Dave and I in here, you would have to pay someone more than what we're getting paid to run and do what we do. So you kind of, you, you are living, you know, the books are so, like this false sense of reality that, you know if if I was to die or whatever and they had to put someone in my position what does that look like for the business so we have to kind of keep that in mind as well yeah key man insurance probably the insurance providers on the call will be saying hopefully you've got key man in there <laughs> yeah and I, like you mentioned as well you do have to enjoy the journey like we're on a journey and we have to be able to enjoy what we're providing for ourselves and the life that we're living at the moment you know you don't want to be living like a pauper, you still want to be able to enjoy what you're doing. Absolutely. And the crowdfunding platform, I think uh, Josie might have been asking, it's actually B-I-R-C-H-A-L. It's an Australian Correct. equity crowdfunding platform. Um, so feel free to search that. I think I've also put your directory listing from the Business Women Australia website. If anyone does want to contact you outside, I'm sure you, you're happy to uh, receive an email if people do have questions or want to connect with you. Um, we do have a little bit more time. Um, what are the funds now being raised going to be used for? Obviously, before it was sort of really establishing that ability to scale. Where are you? Where are you channeling that money? I think Fiona's just thrown that in too. So, yeah. So this one's going to be used for a lot more growth and scalability. Like we're looking to really bring on some more lines to the range. So we're currently, we're doing meat and seafood, which is fantastic, but we want to bring on some more categories to the business. So things like dairy, pantry goods, groceries, that sort of stuff. So we want to Im improve the range. We also want to have faster delivery. So we're looking at, at the moment, it's about two to three, three days on average to get a delivery from us, depending on where you are. So we'd really like to get that down and get delivery to people faster because what we've noticed is people in the city don't like to wait for stuff. Whereas, and they don't have a lot of meat in the freezer or food, I guess, like, you know, you're shopping every day. Whereas it took a bit for Dave and I to realize that because we live on a farm, like we've got three months worth of meat in the freezer. If Armageddon comes, we're right. Whereas people in the city, it's a little bit different. You know, you go to the supermarket every day. So we're trying to be a bit more available for people and a, a bit more of a daily use product. So that's where that's going and, and improve our processing as well. So we really want to have a much more consistency in our processing. We want to have scalability. So we'll be investing in some machinery and some different automations as well. Fantastic. And um, what about your brand? I mean, you're called Our Cow, but you're more than Our Cow, aren't you? Yeah, it's, well, it's a hot topic. Everyone says that. But I think we've really established a brand. Like people are starting to know us and know what the brand is and know that we're not just selling meat. Like I always think carpet court don't just sell carpet. They sell other things. So, you know, we can, I think until someone comes up with a better name, we're going to stick with our cow. It's so true about the, um, you know, the deep freeze. I remember when we moved from the country, I was pregnant with my fourth child and we had a massive deep freeze. Uh, but now I look at the size of our freezer and it's really pathetic, you know. So that's that's a, that's probably a bit of a hurdle to get over is, you know, getting that meat delivered to be able to store it and um, and clear out some of the kids' dim sum yum cha things that they stick in the air fryer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And what about yeah. meeting demand? I mean, how, how when, when demand really does, it would fluctuate a bit too around and seasonally, do you have to predict 
you know, try and predict, I suppose, with so much limited time on your books with new products? Yeah, it's been, it's a balancing act between production and marketing. You know, we, we really want to push the marketing hard, but we have to have the production to be able to facilitate the marketing. So it kind of goes hand in hand. And there has been a few times when we've been caught out, especially during COVID, when um, COVID hit in 2020, March 2020, we, Dave and I were sitting on the computer watching the orders coming in and we were like, God damn, we need to turn the website off because it was just going ballistic and we didn't know how we were going to be able to fulfill the orders. Um, so it is a fine, fine balance between making sure we have enough meat to produce and to be able to fulfill the orders and taking too many. And I think that's where a lot of the crowdfund is going to be coming into to, to make our production more efficient. So we will be using a lot of the funds in that. But yeah, it is hand in hand. And I think a lot more of the, as we invest further into our technology and our um, you know, AI is becoming a hell of a thing at the moment. So we'll be investing a bit more in that to be able to predict what kind of, I guess, products we need to be able to fulfill our orders. And is Tracy, is that your hand back up again? It is, only if no one else has got a question. I've got another one. No, go, go for <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, um, Bianca, it's been, what, five or six years in, in the business. What Have you noticed change in, in eating habits of people? I mean, COVID obviously threw in the fact that people needed to order it the way they did, as you just said. But have you noticed five years or six years is not a long time, but have you noticed much change or people um, focusing well, elsewhere? It's only been four years, but it's like COVID probably was the biggest game changer for people to order online. They became yeah. comfortable with getting their food delivered. They were okay with ordering weird things like, people, you know, between ordering meat and food and like mattresses online, people are okay with that sort of stuff now. So it's just been a, a shift in, I guess, mindset and being okay with your food getting delivered. Probably not delivered. so much in the product range. In the product, yeah. 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 Mm. And are, are people saying to you that they want the dairy and they want the um, these other products? They want basically the supermarket coming to them from you in a sense. Yeah, yeah, like they, you know, somewhere along the lines we've all had a tie to a farm like we might have had our uncle owned a farm or our cousins someone owned a farm and we've kind of we know how good farm produce can taste like the milk that comes straight off the farm and the cheese and the butter and all that sort of stuff so people like want that they want to that nostalgic taste of produce coming from the farm we know how much better it can taste so that's sort of the that's what they're looking for is to, and eggs like bright yellow eggs, eggs that you get when you get from the farm compared to those washed out yellow ones you get from the supermarket so I think that's the kind of stuff people are looking for great great answer thanks Bianca and that they're prepared to pay a premium for as well that's that's the other side of it too isn't it the quality of the produce um okay we've got um Amy Ward you've got some questions want to unmute yourself are you still there Yes, I'm just being a bit of a nut with my tech today. I did put some questions in. Um, I'm curious to know whether you've had any um, or if there is any funding or other support available from government or industry for the initiative that you're doing yourself and that you bootstrapped and that you've had to have crowdfunding for. So I think I know the answer. Um, it's a bit more of a loaded question to say, it concerns me where our support goes as a nation and society. And Nat, I'm probably channeling a little bit of you here because um, what you're doing is a very different approach to the food supply chain uh, than what our supermarkets are creating. Yeah, like I can't say that there's mountains of funding out there for what we're doing, but in saying that, I'm not actively looking for it either. Like if, if I had a resource that was actively on our team that was looking for grants and looking for funding that we could be applying for, I'm sure I'd be able to access a little bit more. But I guess my focus at the moment isn't on that. And if I had a resource in-house that was, that was their job to find us the funding and to find us the grants, maybe there would be a bit more support, but I haven't, you know, had something land on my desk and say here how's here's half a million dollars go and do what you need to do like that would be really nice but um yeah I don't know of anything but it sounds like there's a lot of 
interest for it without you having to do super hard marketing on it. So there's an appetite, pardon the pun, for this um, approach to food, but we're not, as a nation, um, really focusing on it. Yeah, there definitely is. Like, and we're focused, like, as a nation, and we're focusing on climate change and sustainability, environmental practices, and all that sort of stuff. But I think a lot of that can be derived from food. So, if mm. we're focusing on the way that we're producing our food, and there is always going to need be a need for mass produced, industrially farmed food because we have to feed the masses, and not everybody can afford to pay a little few dollars more for produce and whatever. So. Um, yeah, I think there will always there'll, there'll always be a place for that. But if there was more assistance out there for people to farm like this, it would be really helpful. So, um, Bianca, you mentioned the Boosting Female Founders Grant. How much did you get awarded through that um, grant and what did you use it for? So I was actually the highest grant awardee person that had obtained the funding I received 480,000 from the boosting female founders and that was because of our workforce like over 50 percent of our workforce is female and we are regional and the the initiative that I guess I put forward I used it for marketing so we wanted to increase our subscription database that we had as active subscription members to our subscription meet club that's what they went on for and we did a national TV show as well where we worked with a with Channel 10 and a celebrity chef and sponsored that TV show to really tell our farmer story. So we ended up visiting 16 of our farmers and we took the show all across pretty much Queensland and New South Wales and it showcased our farmers and what we were doing. And did that bring about the kind of return on investment that you had expected? Had that been money out of your own business, would you have still done that? If you could have? Um, yes and no. The the brand exposure it gave was really good. Like it gave us a really good exposure for the brand and um, what we were doing and also it gave us a lot of really good content. But from a um, marketing perspective, it wasn't a super high return on investment. Like it was a lot more top line brand awareness rather than, you know, bottom of the funnel acquisition. And is that available to view um, now, still that that show? Yeah, so it was Taste of Australia on Channel 10. So Taste of Australia with Hayden Quinn, we were the major sponsor of the show and a lot of the places that he visited throughout Australia were our farmers. Fantastic. And we'll probably be able to see that on Catch Up or somewhere on yep, Channel 10. Yeah, 10 play. That's fantastic. Um, and Fiona's just made a comment in there about the national soil testing being undertaken, heaps of initiatives from government being fed down to the ground level, uh, and also that the local councils are another place to look for funding, um, particularly through the Department of Agriculture, um, providing funds for, for farmers with access to education. Um, and if you're in farming, you don't need to look too far to access the regen education and so on. Um, and I think, um, you know, that anyone else who's got anything to drop into the chat box that might be of interest to um, people on the call, that'd be great. And we can include that in the follow-up and the thank yous as well. Um, before we finish up today, I'm really interested in what's next for you and, and Dave and our cow going forward. You know, what are the big vision, sort of big picture visions and for you as a couple? Yeah, well, we're really focusing on, like I mentioned, increasing our product range. We want to have, you know, over 20 different product, 20 different categories available through our cow that we source from directly from farmers and just having an impact on the agricultural industry. Like a lot of people say, you know, everyone's talking about it and blah, blah, blah. But I actually would really like to see more people choosing to buy their food through us and having more farmers on board. So that's one thing for the business. And I guess for Dave and I is, is just to enjoy the journey more and um, get back on our farm. Like we're currently living in town because I'm building a house in the shed that we moved into to start with. So a house with water, power, all that sort of stuff. So I'm really looking forward to just having a, a beautiful home on my farm. Oh yeah. my gosh. I'm so looking forward to you having that beautiful home on your farm too. So can you, um, 
also include us on your list. Everyone on the call, I'm sure, will be very happy for you to update us when your crowdfunding opportunities available. We will, you know, even if we aren't a part of it, um, some of us obviously want to be a part of it, but it'd be nice to be able to track it and view it and see how it goes. For those of you who don't want to be on Bianca's email list, you can easily opt out, I'm sure. Um, and Leanne will give you that um, list so you can um, follow up with everyone. I think we just all are absolutely going to be champions and ambassadors for our cow. And I know I can speak for every single woman on this call. You're a total inspiration. If this is what you can do, um, what are you now, 28? God, help me. It's like... <laughs> I'm, I'm just so impressed with this next gen. Um, I would love just to hear, you know, I've got a, I've got a son who's vegan, his girlfriend's, um, him and his girlfriend are vegetarian. What are your thoughts about um, this kind of, it's movement away from eating meat? We don't discriminate. We've got vegans and vegetarians that work for us. We have a vegetarian meat packer that packs meat for us every day, five days a week. We've got vegan, we've got lots of recovering vegans that are part of the community. So, you know, I think I think it's a last resort for people. And what we're seeing is a lot of people would prefer to buy meat and to eat meat through a source like us, knowing that the animals have been looked after, the farmers are getting, the environment's looking getting looked after, rather than turning towards vegan. Like I know that we're doing it for, um, they're doing it for the environment and everything else. But I actually had a really interesting conversation with a vegan the other day, 30 years she'd been a vegan for and for environmental purposes. But she actually went to a farm and watched how they produce wheat and soy and corn and canola and seen the impact that it actually has on the environment. And she turned back to meat because growing animals is far less puts less environmental strain on the environment compared to producing those broad acre crops. So I think it's a big education piece for people to understand how, how are those plant-based foods being produced and what is the actual impact on the environment? I know that those companies have got their own agenda and they're obviously pushing what, what they want people to eat, but, you know, go to a farm and have a look at how canola is produced because it ain't pretty. And um, on, on the point of, um, meat alternatives um, you know you're going into fish um, you're talking about eggs and other produce from the farm would you go and look at um, veggies and fruit yep, yeah definitely and other things like you know veggie patties you know we're not looking down the path of meat lab grown meat because we don't agree with that but things like veggie patties like your bubble and squeak patties and that sort of stuff because we do have a lot of people who contact us and say I'm a vegetarian but my husband eats meat so we you know we want to be able to feed both people in that household through things like vegetables and fruit and other alternatives that you know they can purchase yeah, yeah amazing so we're going to really watch this journey and see how you scale grow um bring bring the farm into our homes so it's real paddock to the plate um thinking and well done you so inspired by that uh and if there's i think that's pretty much it we've we've come to the end of our time together i'm actually going to stop the recording so we can have a bit of a social chat um and if anyone wants to stay and we've got bianca on for another 10 minutes um before we finish up so uh, it's just been incredible. So let me just uh, stop this recording. This will get uploaded to the Business Women Australia YouTube channel. It'll also be up um, on our website for people to be able to access. Um, and thank you to all the ladies for all the incredible questions too. It really makes these kind of Q&As uh, with our, within our community, with our members, um, so much more interesting than just what I've um, um, thought up here. But uh, thank you everyone for being here. And we'll say goodbye from Business Women Australia and be in contact, but don't leave because um, we've got a bit of a chance to have a chat from a social point of view.